In this week's show, we will be discussing the, the latest developments on the COVID pandemic. I know that a lot of people have uh, moved on and they think that um, there's really nothing to worry about anymore. But uh, I want to know from someone who has been impacted deeply by this uh, illness and this virus that has been um, causing a lot of pain and suffering throughout the world. Uh, our guest is Kristen Urquiza. She's the co-founder of Mark by COVID. And she has uh, a very interesting story to, to share about how um, this, um, this all developed in her own uh, life and, and affected her family. Um, can you um, tell us a little bit about what uh, drove you to create this organization and what is the purpose of what you guys do? Sure. Uh, thanks so much for having me on again. Um, yeah, um, Mark by COVID was uh, literally launched eight days after I lost my own dad to COVID-19 in June of 2020, which at the time it was, um, you know, take a journey back. The first summer surge, um, we did not have vaccines. We uh, didn't have very many therapeutics to treat the virus. And um, we had just started reopening from um, shutdowns across the country. And in that reopening, my dad caught COVID, um, got sick, and it was only 19 days between his first cough and his last breath. And I was shocked, I'm an only child, very close to both my parents, and totally not prepared to not only lose a parent, but to lose one in the midst of a pandemic, not being able to be with him, um, and also incredibly disappointed by our leaders at both the state and federal level for really not rising to the challenge to provide clear and concise information on how to keep each other safe. Um, so Mark by COVID was born from that to help people um, like me and others across the country share their stories, uh, help folks, um, you know, come together collectively and um, ask governments to do more, um, ask businesses to do more to protect um, ourselves, our communities, and ensure that uh, less people have to go through what, quite frankly, I went through, which was nothing short of a nightmare. And, you know, this has been a very politicized situation, and I, I work in healthcare, so I've always been open to the idea of you get vaccinated for the sake of the community and for the sake of your family. But the more I've talked to people who are extreme on both the right and the left regarding this issue, uh, they brought up some uh, concerns that they have that have legitimate basis to it, but the way that it was implemented or the way they went about complaining and, and protesting about it created a lot of confusion. Uh, what can you tell us about your dad's views that uh, affected the way that he um, either followed precautions or not based on his perspective? Great question. Um, so my dad was a lifelong Republican who uh, was a supporter of then President Trump and um, our Republican Governor Doug Ducey. So when the state of Arizona, where he lived, uh, opened up and the president at the time and um, our governor was you know, saying that we were safe, that it was safe to go about and resume normal, quote unquote, normal activities. And that um, our governor went so far to say, you know, if you don't have, if you're not a sick person, if you don't have pre-existing conditions, you're gonna be totally fine. So get out there and take a loved one to dinner um, you know, go out and about. And my dad listened. Um, he thought it was safe. And at that time, our conversation started to change. Before that, he believed the pandemic was real. He took lots of precautions. Um, but then he started to question, um, you know, he started to, to uh, basically push back on me and say I was being overly cautious. Um, and that, you know, led him to make poor decisions based upon information that was um, not good. And I think this is, a, this is a common thread throughout the course of the pandemic where we have not, one, we haven't had clear 
in a concise message on how to remain safe. But two, as you mentioned, you know, using this as a political tool has created more uncertainty in our communities and has isolated um, folks into these camps where, you know, a lot of people don't know what to do. And quite frankly, at this point in time, we're just throwing their hands up saying, you know, <laughs> I don't want to do anything else because I've been um, at this for so long. And as a, you know, person who has gone through really some of the worst um, impacts of, of COVID, you know, this is something you don't want to catch. There are, you know, folks that, you know, many, many folks that recover, but many folks who recover that don't fully recover. Long COVID is real. Um, and I work with a lot of people who have, um, whose lives have been completely upended, not because they've lost a loved one, but because they've lost their sense of health um, because they're still struggling with ongoing post-viral illness brought on by COVID. And we just aren't talking enough about um, these, you know, potential um, side effects, let alone who's at most risk of getting these side effects, which are vulnerable folks, immunocompromised people, um, you know, the list goes on and on. And I want to live in a society where we're protecting the vulnerable. And I think that's where we, as, as a country, want to be living in. But right now, our, our priorities are not aligning with our actions. But do we even have those priorities? Because if you look at the medical system, if you look at the way that the homeless population is treated, the veterans, it seems like um, this is just a symptom of an, a bigger problem. And then the self-reliance issue always comes to the forefront. Um, mm -hmm. A friend of mine um, is a fan of Joe Rogan. He said that uh, it, this is a, a positive uh, perspective on Joe Rogan pushing back. He had a, a representative here in Houston, uh, Dan Crenshaw, and he was saying that, that there's a difference between conservatives and liberals, that conservatives have a greater capacity to deal with uh, difficulties somehow, and the liberals are very uh, easily scared and, and fall for all kinds of situations like, like the COVID pandemic. Like they're, they're more cautious and more scary cats as compared to, you know, self-reliant tough guys like him. Um, why is that even uh, part of the conversation um, in, in this culture that we live in? Well, first of all, you can't individual responsibility your way out of a public health crisis um, and the fact that we've you know stripped so much of the response and put it on the backs of um, individuals um, showcases why we have in comparison to other highly developed nations in the 20 countries some of the worst um, you know outcomes uh, in the entire world and I, um, I think that, you know, for us as a nation, I, you know, my dad in particular raised me to, um, you know, he, he would have described himself as somebody who bled red, white, and blue. He was a true patriot, but he also um, instilled in me principles of helping others. He was one of the kindest people I knew who um, never met a stranger, wanted to make sure people were welcome, um, you know, helped out the homeless, individually helped out um, in food drives and, and all sorts of sort of charity causes, even though he wasn't a man of, of many means. And I meet a lot of people like that through this work. And I think that overall, we have um, lost our way uh, with some of those core American values of helping your neighbor, helping your community, and have gotten caught up in this idea that um, it's this finger pointing. Um, and at the end of the day, when it comes to something like a public health crisis, which this pandemic is, it really has, one, brought out the worst in us, and then two, exposed a lot of the systems that weren't working in the first place. And 
you know, more so than liberals or, or conservatives, the pandemic has fallen on the shoulders of the poor, both liberal and conservative. And if you look at numbers across the board in places across the country, time and time again, it's poor folks who are bearing the brunt of, um, of this crisis. And that speaks a lot about, um, actually, I think that speaks further to a conversation we've already been having for almost a couple of decades now about uh, wealth inequities in our country, how a very few um, folks make a lot of money. <laughs> um, and, you know, everybody else is kind of scraping to get by. And so I think that, that it works, um, you know, I think the powers that be are trying to keep it um, in, a, in a frame of left versus right. But when I think about it, I think about it more vers of all of us versus folks with a lot of privilege who've been able to skate by without having to shoulder much of the impact. Can you tell us about the latest uh, developments? Uh, you know, we hear about Korea and Europe having problems right now with COVID and a different variant. Um, have, have people um, moved on too quickly? And is there the fear that we're gonna end up again shutting down, again, having to put on masks? And, uh, and that adds to the confusion because people don't know what to believe in it. Yeah, it's a great question. And um, there's already healthy, you know, an overabundant healthy distrust of the CDC and other institutions, which you know, through the course of this pandemic, I've even scratched my head a number of times at the CDC's recommendation, both under President Biden, as well as President Trump. And it seems to me that the priority underneath both administrations has been trying to push forward a strong economy at the cost of, of the workforce. And so what that translates into today is this premature, uh, fourth or fifth time at this point rush towards normal when not too far off on the horizon we have a, a new variant BA2 which is um, sort of a sub-variant of Omicron which folks uh, which doctors are saying are is even more transmissible than the original variant and that's what's starting to wreak habit, havoc in Europe and South Korea um, you know, other places in Asia. And um, we know from previous experience that this doesn't stay isolated for, to one place or another. What can we do? There's a lot we can do. Um, well, we can't stop necessarily Omicron or other variants from coming um, over that are already here or on their way here. We can implement um, strategies to minimize the spread, such as making um, testing widely available, accessible to all, really double down, doubling down on public education, on how to take a test, when to take a test, why to take a test, and also masking in particular indoor in uh, high congregate settings. Uh, such as if you're going to the mall or if you are going to a concert and those masks need to be well fitted and high quality such as an N95 or a KN95. If we just implemented those two things along with continuing our campaign to vaccinate people, get folks boosted, it would be a very good defense against uh, this upcoming variant that we will see. But what I see right now is this um, unfortunate push towards normal, which will result in a spike in cases in places across the country. And a spike in cases, even if it's a quote unquote less mild version, still puts strain on our healthcare system, putting in jeopardy all sorts of folks, whether or not you have COVID. Um, it, and, it, and it also, any spike in cases, means more people end up getting sick and more people end up passing. And I don't want to, it doesn't have to be this way. We do not need to, we don't have to normalize mass death and disability. 
when people who are concerned about the, the vaccine uh, and the, the few cases of people having a bad reaction say that they're just gonna write it out, they're just gonna get COVID and um, use their own immune system to, to fight it. How would you respond to someone who, who says that children or healthy adults, uh, you know, lower than 50 uh, years old are able to, to have some type of self-immunity. Um, how would you convince someone like that that, um, that vaccination is the way to go? I um, don't know if there's anything I can say or other people can say in order to convince people to take the vaccine. And I, I share that because, you know, I can point to hundreds of individuals who I have met who have lost a loved one under the age of 50 or a child um, who have said similar things. I was just on the phone earlier today with a woman who lost her um, otherwise healthy uh, dad who's fairly young um, and he was unvaccinated in January. And it's a story I hear time and time again. Part of what um, is playing into this unvaccination um, tilt is not only leaders not stepping up and, um, you know, in particular conservative leaders, church leaders, and promoting the vaccine. So, you know, having folks drawn to question its efficacy. Um, but it's also, you know, there is an entire um, universe of all quote unquote alternative facts out there slash people are making money off of, um, you know, sowing distrust and that is not something that I am qualified um, or nobody that I know to be able to combat because it didn't start with vac it didn't start with this vaccine. It's been happening for decades now. I can remember uh, being in college in the two thousand early two thousands and everybody was talking about vaccination and how it would lead to um, you know children being autistic and that's been debunked but this sort of vaccine hesitancy has existed for quite some time and that is feeding into people's resistance so i think that you know the best way and the best hope i can offer is um for individuals who have an unvaccinated loved one um in your circle who you're worried about um, approaching the conversation with care, with love, with questions, listen where coming from, and then offer, um, you know, offer information to, to, from reputable sources if there are people in that person's life who um, they revere, like a, you know, a faith leader, a community leader, a, another relative who is pro-vaccine bring that person in to discuss as well. And at the end of the day, you know, ask them to do it for you. Like if my dad were here, he would have been first in line to get vaccinated. But I also know, you know, I probably could have convinced him otherwise to do it for me. So, um, I don't know what what to think anymore because uh, I was part of um, uh, a committee where they were trying to figure out if Latinos, um, what was the hesitancy for Latinos? And um, I brought up some issues that that have become, a, that I became aware of. And it wasn't the typical, like they're just hearing um, yellow journalistic um, reports at, and Spanish news, or they are, uh, fanatical about the religious views. It was anything like that. It was more like, well, you know, back in our home countries, people are very distrustful of the government uh, because they've been uh, put through the ringer by bad politicians. So it's difficult for people to trust when a politician says, go ahead and go do this. Um, and when I brought that up, uh, nobody wanted to hear it. Like it, <laughs> it was kind of like, um, Oh, you're one of those wackos. And, uh, mm. and for me, it's like, on, unless you get to know uh, the culture and the, the community, you're not going to be able to have a, a foot on the table, um, uh, a chair on the table to be able to um, do pros and cons. Because 
they assume that because you're a Latino, you are super progressive, or they assume that because mm -hmm. you're white, you're a Trump supporter or something like that. And there's all kinds of people in between. So when it comes down to something like uh, you say, if it's uh, scientifically uh, proven or, or based on data, you might be able to get someone to agree based on the facts and how it could impact their families. But instead it becomes uh, all or nothing kind of thing. And what, what do you think about, um, even on, on the people that are pro vaccine, sometimes they get kind of militant. Oh my gosh, they're the worst too. <laughs> this is um, such a important aspect to discuss. Um, and I totally feel you. I think there are a lot of uh, directions we could head with with this. Uh, first of all, one of the things that just sort of irks me to my core is our treatment of Latinos as a monolith. And I think you got at this a little bit with like, oh, you know, you're brown, you're progressive, you're white, you're a Trump supporter. But, you know, Latinos, you know, hail from countries and backgrounds all across Central and South America, um, as well as the Caribbean. And uh, there's a pretty diverse set of folks with different experiences and, um, you know, just kind of focusing our, but our government and our sort of outreach just sort of groups all of us um, into this one category. Um, and quite often it's like, we only care about immigration. <laughs> it's like, um, I, I don't think that's actually very accurate. Like immigration is an important issue, um, but also, you know, we care about our families, we care about our health, we care about climate change. Um, you know, we care, and, and in this last uh, voting uh, in 2020, a top issue to us was COVID and COVID response, which makes a lot of sense because Latino communities were hit very hard, very quickly, and didn't have access to tests, treatment, and other, um, um, other sort of things that more well-off and privileged communities had. And I speak of this from my own experience, too, because when my dad got sick, in our 75% Latino community, no one could get a COVID test. Uh, people were waiting in line for 13 hours in June of 2020 to try to get tested. Um, so, you know, I also have seen a lot of recent research um, that confirms that politicians, Joe Biden, Anthony Fauci, uh, sort of these faces of the public health messaging doesn't work with um, our communities, whether it's Latino, Black, Indigenous, or other people of color communities. Um, there was some research that came out a couple of months ago uh, from the Kaiser Family Foundation that showed um, that those messengers were the least effective in persuading uh, Latinos and other people of color to get the, the, the shot. And yet, if you look at where the funding is going, there's so much funding going into um, sort of bolstering these messages that aren't necessarily messages that resonate with our community, as well as messengers that make sense. And then on the third, third thing that comes to mind on this is that, you know, facts and data are important, but let's just like take a step back and think about other types of quote unquote campaigns or public education or advertisements. Whenever you look at a Nike commercial, there's no, there's no data really being out there about how, you know, the performance of this X shoe is gonna give you, you know, 0.03 millimeters faster of a bounce whenever you're on the tennis court versus that shoe. We don't get down to that. We have actually like 50 seconds of a very emotional, evocative sort of story that is told that connects people with a feeling of, oh, I want to be a fast runner, a really good tennis player. I want to be like them. We don't bring the same sort of approach to public health campaigns, let alone targeting sort of micro universes of Latino women between the age of 20 and 30 who are unvaccinated and, and maybe immigrants. But I think if we took the same sort of approach, 
of really studying those communities, learning what's important to them, the values, the messages, and then sort of treating this like more like a advertisement campaign, we would see products that start to really resonate with people on an emotional level and start to break down those walls to having conversations with doctors and other trusted community folks about sort of hesitations that exist um, to get vaccinated. And then I guess in the last piece that you brought up was just, you know, just general distrust. Um, and that I would say that extends here in the United States. Like we've had um, distrust of politicians or the, the medical industry. Like there's a long track record. I think most people are pretty familiar with the Tuskegee experiments on the black community um, around withholding life-saving um, treatments around syphilis as this sort of you know, racist medical um, maltreatment, uh, malpractice on communities of color. But there's a long track record of us, um, you know, not treating all people equally when it comes to health. And, um, you know, that's something that we have to build trust and um, it's not going to be able to happen overnight. And I think that one of the things that brings me hope thinking about the long-term solutions to this pandemic is really investing in a community health workforce that um, you know takes a totally different approach to um, information to individual health to family health that's not you know it, it just looks kind of more like what um, like dr paul farmer did in jamaica versus how we treat health here in the United States. And I, I think that coming out of this pandemic, one of the things I would love to see, and there's some conversations of this in DC about funding, um, you know, more resources to really bolster up community health centers where people can start to build trusted relationships with folks in their community who can serve as a trusted resource. Um, in part of their landscape of talking about health. So what are initiatives is your organization uh, involved with at this time and what um, results have you seen so far? One of the things that we've uh, been focused on at Mark by COVID is actually just making sure history correctly uh, categorizes this as a big deal, this, this meaning the COVID crisis. I think since day one, you know, politicians across the board have been trying to downplay the severity of this. And, you know, as a result, we're on the eve of having a million people passing this like gruesome benchmark that no one thought possible. A million people um, in the United States that we know of who have passed from COVID. Um, and, you know, what I mean by making sure history accurately reflects the gravity of this situation is that we've been working with cities, states, and um, Congress to recognize a COVID Memorial Day, which we're calling for the first Monday of March, to recognize uh, those who've lost their lives and those that lost their health to this pandemic. Um, and, you know, for the foreseeable future, um, you know, observe moments of, moments of silence, hold, um, vigils and you know for as time goes on have this be a day in the calendar where teachers can develop curriculum to teach about the covid pandemic where there's actually um resistance towards shoving this into the memory hole like we did with the 1918 pandemic and that the hard-earned lived truths of this experience are passed on to future generations so that they can um, learn from our mistakes and um, be better prepared for future public health crises. Um, that work is going really well, despite um, you know challenges along the way. We've had over 175 cities um, pass citywide resolutions marking uh, the day. We've had five states get on board, and we have a resolution in both the Congress, 
in both houses of Congress, so the Senate and the House, um, that's gaining momentum uh, with over 70 co-sponsors on those on those um, on those legislation legislative pieces. Um, you know, aside from that, we've also been working to uh, build up public support for a truth commission of sorts um, to um, kind of modeled after what we saw happen after 9-11 to go through and, um, you know, catalog what happened, what we knew when, what decisions we made and why, so that we can really just know the unvarnished truth. Um, and again, have that um, for not only the historical record and future generations and to learn from this, but also if there were bad actors to be able to hold um, them accountable um, and bring justice to you know people's families who may have lost a loved one as a result of you know somebody um, you know downplaying this or or um, you know taking advantage of the situation. Um, those are two areas in which we've been incredibly active. We've also been really active along the way in um, sharing stories of people who've been impacted. Uh, working to really help personify this crisis and then working to uh, connect COVID, you know, other COVID families with one another for grief support, um, for, um, you know, being able to help bring people out of the isolation of this type of loss um, and, and provide spaces for grief and healing. So, you know, part of uh, dismissing or minimizing the, the COVID uh, pandemic is all these um, urban myths you hear about someone died in a car crash and they blamed it on COVID and stuff like that. And I even heard it from doctors claiming that they were forced by their hospital to have to uh, market it as, as connected to COVID so they can get funding from the federal government. And then I'm like, if that was true, shouldn't there be um, a committee or some type of congressional hearing for fraud? That um, mm -hmm. if it's that rampant, that uh, numbers are inflated to receive either federal or state funding, why is there no whistleblowers? Why is there no people? So, but people quote that like it's, like it's gospel truth to, <laughs> to push their agenda. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you guys come across any of that as as possible? Like, you know how when the governor of New York um, was doing shady stuff and then people died, it didn't come out until later because of whatever they were trying to make him run for president or something like that. So you even see Democrats hiding information to to make themselves look good, uh, just like the Republicans. Have you guys come across any type of almost like Medicare fraud or any type of thing that has made things more difficult for the people who are trying to put out good information? Yeah, um, so what we have seen, I, I know the sort of conspiracy theories that you're talking about, um, and it really runs the gamut as far as things that we hear, and then, um, you know, little things kind of pass uh, pan out to actually have hard hard evidence, but that's actually part of the reason why we are working um, to build support for a COVID commission, a truth commission, to be able to have that uh, the the resources of the and and the backing of the federal government to do that sort of top down inside out analysis, both in the private and the public sector to identify any places where um, one, we did things well, or two, if there was widespread, um, you know, malfeasance of any sort of type. I'm sure that, you know, someplace, somewhere, there was a doctor who felt pressure and did something that they shouldn't have done. But I also know for a fact that I have met due to the hundreds of doctors, nurses, respiratory technicians, and other people in the, in the landscape of hospitals, urgent care centers, 
there have been multiple times throughout the course of this pandemic where people, like they haven't gotten a break. And, you know, it's not normal to have ICUs full of people who cannot breathe. And this is not, you know, some sort of fluke. This is because we have a highly contagious airborne virus that's basically been left unchecked, um, especially as of recent, you know, recently. And um, this should be scaring everybody. Um, I personally have never been into a COVID ICU. When my dad was um, sick, it was at a time where we didn't let anybody into the hospital. But the stories that I hear from folks who have been working day in and day out in these spaces rattled me to the core, as well as the stories that others share with me about, you know, the chance that they got to see and say goodbye to their loved one, or the few people that I've spoken to who lived to tell the tale and the nightmares that they share. COVID is, is, is real and people should be focused on that more than anything else because to your point, if there were widespread sort of fraud on that sort of private level, we would, it, we wouldn't be in this, doctors would be sent, <laughs> doctors would be rising up in uproar because these folks have been rising up in uproar asking for governments to do more to slow the spread and asking for the public to do more to keep themselves and their families safe. That is a consistent ask and a consistent mes message I've heard from doctors across the board. So yes, there is something that doctors have been asking for and it's been for us to slow the spread. And when it comes down to uh, preparedness for um, disasters like this one, uh, is is the health system part of the problem that it's almost like a hotel where you can't have too many beds because you lose money so they weren't prepared or they weren't even interested in having uh, the right amount of, of resources available including masks and breathing machines and all that because uh, there was a cost involved with with storing all that to having it available um, so again, not focusing on the possibility of, of disasters more. Uh, it, I feel that America is very reactionary instead of preventive. Mm -hmm. um, is that one of the things that the doctors have uh, brought up to your attention? Yeah, absolutely. And to that last point of, you know, our sort of, you know, we operate quote unquote best in a crisis uh, versus planning. Um, it's a very sort of reactionary to all sorts of things that we approach. And this is not, this is not the smartest way to go about uh, doing things because then we end up in a crisis like this that's sustained um, and we um, really kind of see the um, entire kind of kinks in the machine start to um, start to sort of spin out of control. And, you know, we, I, I, I've, I've been very involved in advocacy on, on a number of issues over my career. And, um, you know, public health has been one of them. And I knew that we, our public health system was vulnerable um, to, um, when it would be pushed, put against the stress test and that our healthcare system would, was vulnerable if it were put up against a stress test. But I was so shocked um, to see that, you know, nurses and doctors and others were forced to, you know, wear trash bags or recycle their PPE. This, these are sort of lines that we crossed without thinking about it, that, that, you know, caused me to sort of just open my eyes and promise to never close them because I needed to witness the atrocious um, 
situations that we were putting our healthcare workers in for, for no apparent reason. Well, for the apparent reason being to cost, save money, cost savings. Um, I mean, sort of a silver lining is that there has been congressional attention to uh, resourcing and stockpiling um, for future crises. And there's a bill in Congress right now called um, Prevent. Um, it's an act that would, um, you know, help double down on those stockpiles as well as sort of our emergency response system. And, um, you know, we, I think if that is passed, um, we will be much better prepared for future public health crises. But that being said, I, I really think of, you know, COVID as, um, sort of a dress rehearsal to um, the next crisis. And the one that is on the top of my mind is the crisis that we're already living through, which is the climate crisis. Um, you know, we are gonna continue to um, need to pull on um, our health infrastructure to help more people who are like living in vulnerable places and are vulnerable to severe weather and, um, you know, this pandemic has really showcased where we need to invest. And I do not see us fully appreciating um, the need for top-down, bottom-up investment. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy that the infrastructure bill was passed. Um, you know, our roads, bridges, waterways, many of them are approaching 100 years old. Um, needing to be updated. I mean, this is this is of similar sort of need and probably of similar grade. Um, our healthcare system is is sorely um, is sorely under invested in it, and it's built on a profit model. And I think that you know, saving people's lives isn't always the most profitable thing to do, but it's the moral thing to do. And it's quite frankly the oath that people in the medical field take to try and save people. Um, so we really need to get behind, um, you know, these, the people on the front lines uh, to give them the tools that they need to be able to continue to help us. And what has been your experience with other countries and their data? Um, you know, you hear stuff of, you know, from both sides, either some places have become almost militarized where they force everybody to get vaccinated and they'll give you a ticket if you leave your house and then you the the example they always use was like norway or something where nobody was vaccinated and everybody was just dancing in the streets and and everybody was fine so you have these extreme examples of the fears that americans have or the way they think it should go that uh, a small country with a small population can be applied to a big country with a big population or the ones that are very socialist in their health care that they they would um, be uh, almost like fascistic in the, in the way they go about keeping people safe um, from your experience which countries had more success and what system was more helpful and what kind of data are you guys gathering regarding that yeah, um, you know, I, I think that some, you know, a country to look at and, and sort of ask ourselves questions about, uh, you know, and, and interrogating that further is just looking at a country like China, which is incredibly large, um, you know, several billion people, um, very from the largest cities in the world to some of the most, you know, impoverished rural communities, and they've had um, you know, more of a COVID zero approach and, you know, outside of the initial um, sort of wave in Wuhan have been able to overall kind of keep their numbers almost non-existent and incredibly low. And, and this is one of the more extreme examples in which in China, you have to be vaccinated. You, you have basically a, a vaccine, um, you know, passport and uh, the government is, you know, news media that it's a totalitarian place and, and the government is, is very much in um, your day to day life. I've had friends who, um, whose 
parents uh, lived in China and, um, you know, have been able to sort of um, not necessarily be a fly on the wall, but at least ask some questions about their experience and just get a feel of like, oh, is this completely oppressive um, existence where you can never leave your house and quite the opposite in which people feel like they have, um, you know, quite a bit of freedom because they know what they need to do to stay safe. And, you know, I'm not necessarily, you know, arguing from that sort of perspective, but it, it does um, draw into question um, and kind of give some examples of, of different ways that we could approach this um, crisis. And I think that the thing that I'm most worried about overall is our efforts to provide vaccines to um, countries across the world um, and providing, you know, the, the kind of having a global campaign to vaccinate the world. And um, this is incredibly important because whether or not, you know, we get to any targets here in the United States will, will not matter if we let the virus continue to um, mutate in places across the country, across the globe, excuse me, where, um, you know, the, the proprietary information for make the recipe basically for making the vaccine doesn't exist. And um, that sort of uh, debate is wrapped up in um, patent law and international law. And, you know, quite frankly, companies uh, don't want to hand that over to help countries make um, in-country in vaccines because it's very valuable to them and they've been making a lot of money off of it so far. Um, you know, to me that jeopardizes our entire um, progress that we've made to date, whether or not you're in a totalitarian place like China or a completely loosey-goosey place um, as far as um, mandates go. Um, that will continue to jeopardize our ability to um, really kind of be to a different, a real different phase of this pandemic. And uh, the United States needs to play a much larger leadership role in facilitating um, that flow of information so that people all across the globe can get vaccinated. So when people say that, um the percentage of people who die from COVID is so low that they rather take their chances. Would you call it like a Russian roulette kind of situation? Because that was my original conflict with uh, one of our guests. Like he just kept on saying, you know, it's, it's such a tiny little bug that, you know, you think that a paper mask is going to stop it. So he kept on using the herd immunity idea. And now a lot of, of us got Omicron and we're kind of, um, you know, even if you're boosted or, or um, so I wanted to confirm this with you. If you're vaccinated for like the original uh, COVID and then you got the boost, which COVIDs are you, um, variants of COVID are you protected from? And the same goes with having Omicron. Like, is, are you protected from Omicron for a few months and then you got to get boosted again? Because some people are saying that it's just, it's going to be a never ending experiment to try to get people boosted every three to six months. And it's just, it wears people out. Uh, what is the latest data? And is, is there even such a thing as herd immunity that has been pushed a lot? And will that ever even happen with the limited vaccines and with other countries not having access to it? Yeah, herd immunity is totally off the table. <laughs> and that is, um, you know, at least for the foreseeable future and people, um, you know, that is a, um, you know, theory that could have been um, a potential had we aggressively, um, you know, gotten people vaccinated very quickly and met sort of those really high level benchmarks of like 80% double vaccinated very quickly. Um, and we're nowhere on track to do that. And I, I, I doubt given, you know, some of the issues that we talked about already um, that we will ever be able to pass that threshold. That being said, um, it is important to get vaccinated to protect yourself as well as um, in particular vulnerable people. And, um, you know, the, the recommendation for vaccines are 
you know, the, if you had the Pfizer or Moderna, the two shot series, and then a boost. And for the J&J, &J, the one shot plus a boost. Um, for some people who are extremely immunocompromised, um, they have recommended a case by case uh, basis, a fourth shot. And again, this is like, if you were a cancer survivor whose immune system was completely wiped out um, and are you know, not supposed to get sick from anything, th this is sort of the type of, of, of individual profile that has been um, you know, on a case by case basis approved for additional boosters. Um, to this idea of like, is this going to be never ending? I think a thing to think about is that every single year, the flu vaccine that, that we get, well, first of all, not enough people get it to begin with, but the flu vaccine that we get is a slightly different formula every single year. And the reason why is because viruses are made just like most things to survive. And because viruses, like this person said, teeny tiny, they actually are pretty simple. Um, and they are simple, that makes them highly easily able to mutate and change. And so every single year we do our best bet, our sort of best research and both best data to uh, formulate a vaccine against the flu that we believe to be the most prevalent strain of flu virus. I am imagining COVID to kind of turn into something like that where we may need to be you know along with our annual flu shot getting our annual covid shot against the most you know most prevalent strain or the the most deadly strain that we know of but at this point it's it's actually still too early to know so the best thing that everybody can do to keep themselves and one another safe is to you know get vaccinated if you're not get boosted Make sure you're boosted. And then when you are in indoor high congregate settings to mask with a high quality N95 quality um, type mask. And if you're going to go visit, you know, your grandmother or your uncle who had cancer, take a COVID test before. If you come up, it's a at home COVID test, you can get them for free um, from the government website, covidtest.gov. Um, they take 15 minutes, they're like highly accurate, and that extra level of protection um, really could save somebody's life that you love. So what has been your experience trying to work with governments? Has it been the, the, the clown show that most people talk <laughs> about? Like they say, they can't even get the mail to you. How are they gonna get past uh, all the red tape and things like that? Or has it been a um, like not as bad? Because I was in the last show we were discussing how liberals and and conservatives hate the government for different reasons. Liberals hate it because they don't do enough, and conservatives hate them because they're too involved in people's lives. But for our society to to function, we need government and we need institutions. So what has it been like to start a grassroots organization and to reach out to? government institutions to try to create a better system? Has it been an uphill battle or has it been a, a hopeful one? It's a good question. I mean, it's been both at different times. And I think that the thing that is hopeful for me is that I do get the sense that, um, at least at the federal level, there is a commitment to, um, you know, there's a commitment to this pandemic and that it's real, that it's affecting people's lives and that we need to do, um, do things about it. Um, that being said, it, it differs on, depending on where you live, um, as far as sort of the state or municipality level goes. That's something that I've seen across the board is like your experience of the pandemic varies wildly depending upon where you live. Um, you know, I, I'm in San Francisco. It took a totally different approach um, than most places to the pandemic. And it was always super easy to get tested. Um, it was super, e there was a ton of community, um, you know, resources and mutual aid groups that continued for a very long time. 
uh, to assist people. But that wasn't the case uh, where my parents grew up, where I grew up and where my parents lived in Arizona. So um, that's something that to me is nails on the chalkboard and a reason to have a coordinated response amongst different states because as we know, this and other viruses don't, do not know state or interna international boundaries. And, you know, just as we have you know, to this point of like conservatives, government's too much into our lives, liberals, not enough in our lives. The way that I think about this crisis is more akin to a war than anything else. And, you know, the United States, uh, we have prioritized, you know, our military spending for, for decades. And as a result have, you know, the strongest uh, military in the entire world. Um, that at the end of the day is government. <laughs> and we are not approaching this pandemic with that sort of wartime um, effort lens on. And that to me is, is very frustrating. And just to finish off, so you feel that it wasn't taken seriously at the beginning for political reasons, that it was treated as um, something will pass away. And I still can't believe that uh, the guy who was in power would say, oh, it's just going to wash away, it's going to blow away. Um, is that like a nefarious thing to do when you know um, there's, there's evidence that there was a call from the Chinese uh, prime minister telling him this is really bad? And then somehow it, it was almost like um, like purposely dismissing something for political points. Um, what other than evil can you call that? Um, power. I mean the 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 pandemic came in the in a in a election year, an important election year um, for a guy who you know, won the electoral college, but didn't win the popular vote. And, um, you know, he had a strong economy uh, going for him. And so I think that, you know, the, the, this, this pandemic, um, you know, obviously would threaten that and um, threat and you, you know, that's basically game over for reelection. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's, about holding power um, at any cost. And that is not only um, evil, it goes against, you know, what, you're, what you swear to uphold the constitution when you take that office. Um, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Um, we have experienced so many more deaths than we needed to had we just approached this um with um you know purpose purposefully from the get-go and and you know i suspect that my dad probably would be here too well, we want to uh, offer our condolences i know that it is a very tough situation and um you know the the hope is that you know his life can be a blessing and that by you um you know keeping his legacy alive by helping others that, uh, that would uh, give people hope and the ability to uh, not have to go through that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Well, uh, hopefully uh, this will be the last time we talk to you, but in the future, if, uh, if, those, if things are still bad, you know, two years um, after, uh, who knows, um, they say that the um, flu the Spanish flu uh, was around for like four years. Uh, do you feel that um, it might be like that? It's just be like touch and go for a while until we get our, our act together? Unfortunately, I think it's gonna be a little bit touch and go. Um, and hopefully it doesn't um, hold out for four years. But, um, you know, I think the thing that, um, you know, we're also focused on is, is you know, unlike the Spanish flu, which we basically chose to forget, is to not forget this um, and what happened so that we can be better prepared for the next pandemic. So um, hopefully, 
we don't have to be in such a mess again. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, we appreciate what you guys are doing and um, we'll have information about your organization on our podcasting platform. But um, if anybody wants to reach you from, uh, we have, this is a radio show. So if anybody wants to reach your organization, would you like to share your website or contact information? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name's Kristen again, I'm with Marked by COVID. Our website is markedbycovid.com. And you can send any um, questions if you want to follow up to info, I-N-F-O at markedbycovid.com. Wonderful. Thanks again for your time and, and hope um, you keep on doing good work in, in the world. Thanks so much for having me. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks.